African markets later. The Nigerian economy is currently in dire straits, apart from the urgent need for policymakers to reflate the economy. It is critically important for policymakers to also tackle the twin challenge of rising inflation and unemployment rates, with inflation and unemployment at record high of 12.82% and 27.1% respectively. That statement was the overall assessment of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry of the second quarter GDP report released today by the Statistics Office. Now, welcome my panelists to this one-hour special edition of Arise Exchange to deal down into the latest economic numbers. Kerry Booker, a former chairman of the Nigeria Economic Summit Group and the current chairman of Sunu Assurance PLC. From Abuja Studios, Paul Alaje, senior economist at SPM Professionals. Also, Michael Famorotti, chief economist at CS Business. And of course, in our Lagos studios here, Joshua Debisi, banking sector analyst at Vertiva Capital Management. Good evening, gentlemen, and welcome to the show. Good evening. Thank you so very much. Good evening. We appreciate your, all of you being here on the program. So let's get started first with the uh, breaking news from the central bank. What we just heard from the central bank is an, a circular to all banks, all authorized dealers, and the general public. The central bank says it's tackling overpricing, overinvoicing, transfer pricing, and says that will no longer be allowed from M being open for any LCs or any other transactions uh, through agents or third party and says from henceforth, this will no longer be allowed. Uh, let me start with you in the banking sector, Joshua Debussy. Well, Boasin, I think that what we need to um, realize is that this is a policy that should have been enacted. I'm surprised that it hasn't been in place for, you know, from time because this is going to sort of <laughs> stamp out some, you know, shady practices and some shady dealings. And obviously, you know that the central bank has been trying to plug loopholes and gaps where they've been bleeding for an exchange. So this is one of the policies that will help to do that. But obviously, it shouldn't take such a massive crisis to, you know, inspire the CBM to enact such a policy. This should have been in place for, from, from decades ago, I think. But Obviously, better late than never. I think that this will help to, to plug some gaps and also fight against corruption in, 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 in some way. Very interesting raising the court in, on, on this conversation. Let, let me ask uh, Kiari Booker, who is uh, the, uh, the chairman of Suno Assurance and a former chairman of the Nigeria Economic Summit Group. I'm sure in the Nigeria Economic Summit Group have touched on a number of areas in which the government can cut waste, especially when it relates to matters of this nature. Mr. Booker. Uh, this one, as BC had mentioned, this one had been long in, uh, uh, in coming. I mean, it's something that is natural, really. Uh, what we have is a situation where third parties can step in between the supplier or the original uh, manufacturer or whomever in providing invoices, oh, yeah, yeah. which then the FX will be um, obtained. Uh, by having it a direct from the originator, then there would be uh, there won't be any shady transactions. There wouldn't be suspicious transactions and material pricing would actually be accurately reflected. So in that regard, I think it is, it is the right moment, although it is coming a bit late, but uh, it's also one of those situations. It's only when you are broke that you start looking under the pillows and under, under the, your couch and chair to see if there are any coins left. Uh, I think that's the situation with us. We are, we are. It is basically a dire situation as far as FX is concerned, and we are responding to it. Uh, by that, I mean the whole country. Uh, of course, the monetary policy side being central bank with the mandate of managing the uh, exchange rate. And this is one of the places where they can plug the, um, the, 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 the leaks or the leakages. Okay, talk about uh, plugging uh, uh, leakages, uh, uh, Paul Alaje. Over invoicing, uh, transfer pricing, double handling charges, uh, these are familiar uh, problems within the Nigeria's bureaucratic system, procurement processes, and what have you, even in the private sector. 
Yes. Um, well, I, I'm happy that CBN has come up with this uh, policy and this secular, and I believe this will be the beginning of more policy to come. Uh, people that have studied CBN over the years, we notice that when CBN wants to take decision, it starts with the first step. This is the first step central bank is taking, and I strongly believe that many more of these will come. What we would they, not, the usual practice for those corrupt elements within the system is to put more figures, add additional money to uh, what they want to put in terms of imp uh, for importation that is reflected on from him, etc., etc. And apart from that, they also had because central bank give, uh, gave a, gave room for 15 percent advance payment swift transfer. Some, I mean, most of which is coming to an head now. So if it's an LC, there must have been discharge letter uh, from the recipient bank, the bank receiving such fund either in UK or US or China before such fund uh, will be uh, provided for those that want to, uh, that for the companies that is sending. And the good news again is that middlemen is being eroded, middlemen is being removed, which I think is another good one. And more importantly, CBN is saying for those over invoicing and extra charge handling, it will now confirm Pricing, which I, I'm, I'm surprised that that has not been done before now, but central bank is not going to confirm if the price that uh, an individual from Nigeria wants to import is competitive before such importation is released because what we should understand with FX is this is as important as a national asset. Interesting, uh, this issue about uh, procurement uh, and what have you. So let me ask uh, uh, a, uh, a carry book uh, very quickly. Uh, how much more do you think can be done with that? Well, you know, we reform the procurement process, but again, reports over the last couple of years show that the, 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 the elements there that are bleeding the government resources and by extension passing some of these prices to Nigeria, because when you have over invoicing and overpricing, is the consumer at the end of the, at the tail end that get to suffer. Um, it's, a, it's a game, actually. People are gaming the system. And so um, the overall uh, percentage of it compared to the regular trade and transactions and importation of equipment and all of that, um, this might be a small fraction. But when you look at it overall, let's say year in, year out, it adds up, you know, trickle, uh, you know, those small trickles or those small um, uh, add-ons can actually very pretty quickly you run into billions of dollars. So I think the central bank is doing the right thing. Uh, the, 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 the problem is that some people might feel it's too bureaucratic, but going through that pains uh, once or twice, then people will build and automate the process and make it better. But I think at the end of the day, it is going to be better for the country's outlook and for the limited exchange that we have. I mean, it, we have to be pushed back this far for us to consider this element. There are many others, but I think this is a good starting point uh, and then see how uh, we go about encouraging the right kinds of behavior when it comes to uh, exchange-related transactions. In terms of, Mr. Kerry, in terms of Nigeria's image, globally speaking, as we go into the new AFCFTA, in which we'll trade within ourselves in Africa, but we'll still have to do import and export, how much important do you think, how important do you think this step by the central bank is here? Uh, this may not necessarily be much of a factor when we're considering our participation in AFCTA. We just have to work on our economy to make sure that we become a major player within the within the continent because the people that are going to be at an advantage in the in 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 the continent as far as afcta are concerned are those that have already um gone ahead and have grown their industrial base meaning the industries meaning basic manufacturing whether it is light or medium man sized manufacturing cases in point there are a lot of case studies in ethiopia uh, Kenya and some other countries where they have gradually over the run, la last 10 or 20 years where they have actually pivoted in those directions and they do less and less importation of Chinese goods than us. So we may have to go back to the drawing board uh, and pick up the NIRP, the Nigerian Industrial Revolution uh, Plan, uh, and actually dust those papers and put incentives so that we become, also become a manufacturing uh, concern.
Because the game at the end of the day is whatever raw material we are producing, we need to add value before we export. Whatever we are importing, let it be machineries and equipment and things that will actually, when imported, will be a catalyst for value-added services and uh, products and services. So essentially, we need to reorient our own strategic economic plan uh, for the future. If we want to jo create jobs, then we have to be in those areas that are tough mm. to crack. And we have to do that. And we got to be competitive uh, with the rest of our neighbors in the uh, in the continent yes again but, but if your if your fx reserves and all of that is being squirreled away through uh, dubious and uh, fraudulent uh, uh, over invoicing and all of that i'm not sure that is good news uh, let me ask uh, uh, michael famoroti uh, the chief economist at uh, cs business michael welcome to the program thank you for having me here Yes. So, so the central bank is stopping from M uh, going through agents or third parties, says this dubious over invoicing, uh, 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 transfer pricing and double handling charges has to stop. Yeah, indeed. Um, I think my colleagues on, on the panel have really analyzed and broken that down very well. Um, it's a move that has been long in coming. We're glad to see it. Um, it obviously is not a panenka to the issues that we're seeing in the market right now, um, but hopefully it is just the first step. Um, I do think that that it's important to be aware of the reality that the reason we're having this discussion is that there are structural flaws in our foreign exchange markets. And we can keep pushing that along, but at some points we need to deal with those. Um, I was expecting that 2020 might be the year. Um, the fiscal authorities made certain promises to the World Bank and Co. in terms of unifying the rates. Um, so far, we've seen moves to go towards that, uh, but it's still very clear that um, the market is too, com too complex and it allows behavior that that is not productive for the economy. And that's why we're having this conversation. Uh, OK, and this looks like part of the steps to uh, uh, keep the house clean, part of the house cleaning uh, pr process by the central bank. I uh, thank you, my panelists, Paul Alaje, uh, Kiari Booker and um, uh, Joshua Debisi. Thank you, everyone. Let's go to the GDP numbers. And I'm going to have everyone speak for about 30 seconds. What's your immediate reaction to this 6.01% uh, 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 GDP reading or 6.10% GDP contraction in Q2? Let me start with you. Uh, Mr. Buka Kerry. Um, it, it was surprisingly um, higher, uh, well, higher in the, in the, than I expected. I was expecting worse story than this, but it basically means that there is a, some form of um, uh, economic activity. But I think it's largely due to the slowdown in Q2 uh, as a result of the lockdown due to the pandemic. So it's 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 really uh, expected, and I was even expecting that uh, Q1 would have also been uh, been negative. But Q1 we managed to keep ahead above water. So technically now we have to watch how Q3 is going to uh, uh, develop. Uh, but as far as the average uh, Nigerian citizen is concerned, we are in a recession. Really, uh, recession is. Um, uh, and, and it is actually, broadly speaking, both sides of the uh, main economic sectors, the oil and the non-oil, both are in that negative six point something uh, uh, negative growth rate. So it's, it's an outcome that is really expected when there, are, when there is very little uh, that, that, that is, that is uh, taking place. I don't think there is any area that one can point to that had any uh, positive um, growth, uh, except for one or two out of about 30 sectors. Therefore, um, it's, it's, it's just we are just in that party that all the major countries in the world have been facing, uh, even though ours is less. Uh, and I, I, I see that um, going forward, the rest of the year is also going to be challenging. It may not be this challenging since we are going... We are having some partial 
uh, relaxation of the lockdown. Mm. But I do expect that there would be an impact on agricultural production. There would be impact in the services sector, accommodation, uh, hospitality industry, and so on and so forth. Uh, of course, naturally, the transport sector has been terribly hit uh, by, by the numbers. So the data is actually talking true to what is being felt by the average person. And it's, um, it's, it's one of those things that we just have to face it. And uh, there has to be plans on how do we recover and how quickly can we uh, get out of this? Should there be, uh, uh, you know, even a vaccine or whatever that come down the road? But I don't see any major improvement in our economy until possibly uh, 2021 or mid-2021. Uh, uh, great. Uh, Joshua, uh, what's your th initial thought at Vetiva Capital uh, as uh, uh, an investment bank and a securities uh, firm when these numbers are uh, released uh, against your expectations? Well, um, so in terms of our expectations, we were expecting to see a contraction in the second quarter. But I think when you look at the numbers, you start to see a bit of a pattern in terms of the sectors that were the worst affected. Um, most of them had to do with physical activity. So you look at your mining and quarrying, you look at your transportation, you look at even your real estate. All of these sectors had to do with almost like physical activity. So where there were shutdowns implemented, where you know people were not allowed to travel interstate, obviously like your aviation sector, your road transportation sector, and all these other sectors, were affected the most while you see your financial services growing by about 28% um, year on year. So that just tells you that all the activities that could have been carried out remotely did not suffer to the same degree as all your you know, physical and manufacturing and transportation sectors. And this is part of what we were expecting. Now, obviously, the problem is that even with partial easing of lockdowns, um, most of these sectors will not return to anything close to full capacity this year because obviously there are still cautionary measures in place in order to sp stop the spread of COVID-19. Now, as long as this is the case, we won't see a real ramp up in economic activity that will take our economy back to where it was pre-pandemic. However, the nature of this economic slowdown, I think, gives us a little bit of hope that whenever there is a recovery, maybe induced by either a vaccine or some sort of control for the virus, then we will see a much swifter um, economic recovery due to the fact that this was not an um, economic slowdown caused by, you know, other financial or economic factors. It was caused by, you know, a pandemic and the necessity of shutting down activity in order to stop the spread. So mm -hmm. I think that gives us some encouragement. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the agriculture, 1.58% uh, positive reading. Paul, uh, this is a very surprising figure. Many people th thought that agriculture would sink. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not surprised because uh, even during the lockdown, at it, at, uh, after some time, the presidential tax fall on COVID-19 had exempted agriculture. Recall that, that people are at home does not mean they will not heat. So farmers, particularly those within the value chain of agriculture, processing rice meal, et cetera, et cetera, really were still functional. We did not have a complete shutdown of, of process. There was that pass giving unique uh, pass given to ag, I mean, to organizations organizations within the sectors and also small scale uh, window that were given to the northern land because at the time it fell within uh, the planting season. If that were not the case, uh, inflation would have been as high as about 18 percent, more like what we experienced in 2016, 2017, where we had the last uh, recession as a country. But the good news is that even though we had the recession, some of the sectors within the economy still grew. Telecom, for instance, it grew significantly then financial services also had some level of growth because they could uh, maximize windows of not necessarily having physical contact because of social distancing. But what comes to our mind as an organization when the report was released this morning 
fourth was that we were, we, 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 we went the way of the rest of the world uh, to close our economy because many leaders around the world wasn't sure what tomorrow we hold. Nobody has been on this road before. That was why second quarter report uh, for growth showed a negative growth, aid, which went, of course, into minus 6.01%. But some countries will recover very quickly, while some others may have an L-shaped recession. I hope that Nigeria will have a V-shape or at was a U-shaped recession. But what we drive this conversation, what we drive the conversation will be beyond agriculture. There must be that forward integration beyond agriculture for us to have manufacturing. Yes, interesting. So that's, that's why the manufacturing, that's, uh, Paul, like the United States Paul, that's why the manufacturing sector, when well, you look at manufacturing sector, 8.78%, other manufacturing sector, uh, GDP also went down 14.31%. That shows that there's still this disconnect in Nigeria between our whole talk and interventions in agriculture culture and what happens within the agro-industrialization sector. Uh, speak to us on that. Uh, thank you, Paul. Let, uh, let me get uh, uh, views from uh, uh, Michael Famorotti on this. Um, so I consider that the manufacturing sector did actually better than I expected. Um, when I look at food and beverage in particular, um, I'm quite pleased with the, um, with the number there. Um, food and tech, um, textiles were, were a lot worse. Um, but I think the manufacturing sector, if you look across other countries, um, manufacturing sector was actually worse hit than it was in Nigeria. Um, haven't been able to figure out why, again, it might come down to um, the severity of the lockdowns and the seriousness at which we took it here. Um, but I think the manufacturing sector um, not declining anywhere near as much as services was a positive sign. And does and does tally with the um, PMI numbers that came out from the CBN, where I think the lowest it had dropped to was around 40 in May. Um, so I think that that's a good sign. Um, and if I were to pick out um, positives, it would definitely be the fact that manufacturing didn't go down as much as we would have thought. And of course, as people have said, telecoms and banking um, mm. did well. I think it's important to note that while the this quarter's GDP numbers were driven by supply side factors, the recovery will largely be driven by demand. And, um, that's and be this is where the stimulus package comes in. Yeah, that, that, that's, we'll, we'll talk about trade, transportation, and all of that when we come back after trade. My panelists, stand by everyone. Thank you very much. We'll be right back in two. A uh, quick uh, look out to the, some of the equities markets for the for an African day, first Monday of the, of the week. And this is the GSE, the biggest exchange on the continent, a roaring 1.21% to start the, the week. That's it, crossed the 55,000, uh, left the 55,000, went into 56,000, a very solid day there. Uh, but the uh, 3842, a flat reading for the Lusaka Stock Exchange and a bit of a less than one cent for the stock exchange in uh, Botswana. Meantime, 0.48 percent, positively about half a percent for the Mauritius Stock Exchange, and of course 1.33 percent uh, negative for the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange. That's give you a bit of a snapshot of the Southern African markets. Uh, my panelists, once again, on this special GDP discussion, nice to thank you to uh, Kerry Buki, a former chairman of the Nigeria Economic Summit Group and the current chairman of Sunu Assurance PLC from Abuja Studios, Paul Alaje, senior economist at SPM Professionals, also Michael Famuruti, uh, chief economist at Steers Business, and Joshua WC Banking Sector Analyst at Vetiva Capital Management. And let's take a look at the top laggards or the worst performers in the latest economic uh, GDP. You see the numbers we put out on your TV screen. But let's continue this conversation around the most important sector for this pandemic. That's the pharmaceuticals and chemicals. That sector went up within the period under review. So let me start with you. Uh, Joshua, what your uh, thought is around the uh, GDP numbers that we saw from the chemicals and pharmaceuticals sector? Well, Boston, I think what we should um, first remember is the fact that um, any pharmaceutical or chemicals um, activity we see in the Nigerian economy, unfortunately, might not fully um, 
reflects what's going on in other parts of the world, simply because, um, unfortunately, when you look at the scale of our pandemic, or you look at the scale of treatments and the scale of cases, in fact, you see that we're lagging behind the rest of the world quite significantly. So when you factor that in, the chemicals and pharma going up by only 3.79% sort of makes sense due to the fact that, you know, outside of simple treatments and, you know, palliatives to sort of keep our patients and our victims um, healthy, we don't have any cutting edge technology or any cutting edge pharmaceutical company that is coming in to sort of break through and provide a cure right. or work on a vaccine. Now, aside from that, we have also seen that this pandemic has opened up a few um, issues within our Nigerian health system, not just to do with um, treatments, but also to do with facilities and obviously the level of care that we're able to offer. And we've seen a, a number of, of prominent individuals having to leave the country in order to get adequate treatment. Now, that just reflects poorly on, you know, the level of technology that we have available to the rest of us and the fact that we are not able to fully utilize this opportunity to expand an, an area of the economy that could, you know, have a positive impact on the general economy and also improve our balance of trade with the rest of West Africa and the world. Mm. Uh, Michael, let me get your view very quickly about trade. This is our trade sector, uh, a negative 16, uh, I think about 16.59% uh, in real terms. This is one key sector uh, for us. Yeah, so the, the worrying thing about trade is um, the, the size of the decline was definitely driven by the pandemic. Um, but it's a sector that has been contracting for most of the last five years. Um, and it has been a bellwether of the underlying ill health of the Nigerian economy. Um, I expect trade to bounce back um, to you know, low negative um, in Q3. Like people have said, um, once society starts doing business again and people start trading, um, those numbers are going to go up. Um, but at the same time, the, there is still a fundamental weakness in trade um, I think the last time it grew was sometime in 2018. Right? So we, yes, we are sort of all, I think, um, roughly surprised positively, positively by the numbers, um, but it does not distract from the fact that even without COVID, um, the economy has been weak um, and has been propped by sectors like telecoms for the last few quarters. Um, and trade is definitely one of those guilty ones. Um, uh, Mr. Kerry Booker, how do you think we can get our trade sector back up and running? <laughs> I think, I, I think uh, the trade sector picks up, of course, naturally when the whole world uh, decides to start um, exchanging goods and services. As um, highlighted by, uh, um, I believe, Michael earlier, uh, that uh, trade over the trend had been declining over the years. Uh, and the, the key is that um, everybody says we are a trading nation. And I don't think uh, trade, generally speaking, is good for any, uh, any, any economy. But we need to also be focusing on some of the things that we need to do in terms of value adds and all of that. Then the trade can come in and be the catalyst in driving those, those goods and services out across and also in inwards. Um, and, and of course, when you put certain restrictions as CBNR done over the last uh, two years or so, uh, naturally the first uh, to fall in those uh, different sectors would naturally be in the, or generally speaking, in the trade subsector. So, so essentially, I think it is something that is expected and we have seen it. And of course, this just compounded the equation uh, for us as a nation. Uh, however, we still need to look at it from a strategic viewpoint. That is, what are the things that we need to do as a nation to, um, and can this be an opportunity for going back to the drawing board to say that, look, uh, all the things we are doing as a country is not generating the right kinds of jobs, the right kinds of uh, economic growth that we need, et cetera, et cetera. Then how do we address those? So that those are more larger strategic discussion that we must, as a country, have. 
And those conversations are necessarily will be tough ones. Uh, and, and then once we agree on those, then we begin to see how we can alleviate this. But in the meantime, I think once the global economy opens up, we will be also having the trade impact mm. uh, role to, to catch up with it. I would not see us go back to the good old, uh, even, even 2014, 2013 uh, times, uh, but certainly there would be some level of uh, uptick mm. in that. Sector. We've got a lot of work to do with trade. Uh, textile sector uh, for you, uh, uh, Paul Alaje, uh, at Abuja Studios. Uh, this is one sector that the central bank uh, has been very key about, talked about it very early last year. I've been meeting with the textile uh, companies. I've met with some of the governors in the northern part of the country and elsewhere, trying to get the textiles up and running. This is a sector that was up 1.03% in Q1, but sank a massive 14.43% in second quarter. Now, yeah, it's because it was not one of those uh, sectors that was considered critical by the presidential task force as special exemption was not given to textiles. Besides that, how did we even get to this law? Before now, Kaduna, as at 1958, was considered as a textile orb of the entire West Africa. But that is no longer the case. I did an article in 2016, I repeated something similar in 2017, of how Nigeria creates jobs, two million jobs every year, but not for Nigerians, for Chinas and for Indians. And what do I mean by this exactly? The clothes we all put on, the person in Abuja, Mr. Kiari, yourself in Lagos, and the person in the studio, and, and me here, Mr. Faroti, all of us, most of the materials we put on, 80% of them are imported. It is possible that Taylor must have sold these materials in Nigeria. But where are the jobs? Is it uh, with the uh, farmer in Castina that farm cotton and export at very low, very cheap rate? Uh, abroad, and it's, it, it's turned to what we all want to use in Nigeria, and we have one or two tailors that is not so structured to put them together for us to wear. The truth is, the foundation for trade to work in terms of export promotion and import substitution, and import substitution will be when we can find a lasting solution and look at our economy broadly, moving it away from crude in terms of uh, cutting farming, crude, crude oil, crude, agriculture, crude, to secondary where we can have conversation around manufacturing, where jobs can be sustainable, where growth can be promising, and where economy can be long-lasting. If we don't focus on it, and you know there are fundamentals that surround this, which of course includes power supply, which includes, uh, uh, which, which include infrastructure, and so on and so forth. If these fundamentals are not in place for us to build textiles, name it, trade, and all other most important infrastructure, I'm afraid. Anytime we have an exogenous variable we cannot control. Why did we have this kind of fall? Because uh, the pandemic uh, is not just asking for money, it's also asking for life. Uh, it's taking life over a thousand according to NCDC report today. And we have seen the report from uh, National Bureau of Statistics that also said uh, the, 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 the economy has plunged into a negative minus 6.1%. Uh, so when you put this together, one thing is certain, we need to do beyond just uh, considering in one major sector. We need to pay critical attention to all other sectors like Texas. And what President Obasanjo just did years back was to put about 100 billion to that sector, which never worked, because those are not the real conversation. It is difficult for operators within the sector to compete with imported materials that is coming to Nigeria today. Some level of protection must be given to them, apart from supporting them financially, uh, because of the kind of at economic atmosphere we have today. Power supply is major requirement for us to have an impute and other impute factors. Oh, let's have some meal. Let's let's have some let's some. Uh, let's eat some of this GDP, shall we? Joshua, we we'll look at the food, beverages, and tobacco. Uh, th these were sectors that were negative in the second quarter GDP numbers, but not as significant as everyone will think. Well, I mean. Food, beverages, and tobacco, obviously, due to the fact that um, people were stuck at home for a, a large period of time, I think, obviously, you'd expect that, you know, there would be less opportunities for people to, you know, engage in some leisure, leisure activities that would mean the consumption of these goods would, would go down pretty significantly. And then you have to think about, obviously, the fact that a lot of restaurants were, um, you know, only providing 
um, delivery services. So this really cuts output significantly. Um, on top of that, you know, the, the entire dynamic of the pandemic meant that people were going, were having to, you know, save more. There was a lot of uncertainty. So a lot of casual consumption was, was cut out. And this will obviously affect your, your restaurants, it will affect your beverages, it will affect your spirits and your tobacco. Um, so all of these factors really, you know, come together. At the same time, the Nigerian factor means that they won't be cut out completely, which is why the um, decline was not as significant as you might have expected, because you can't keep a Nigerian from having a good time, no matter the circumstances, really. And that, that is exactly what, what is being reflected here with a 3.01% decline. Um, I think, <clears throat> you know, going forward, we might, we might obviously expect that sector to be one of the ones that recovers more sharply than others, obviously due to the fact that there's been easing of lockdowns and, you know, there's a, a bit of a return to, you know, the going out, Al although the curfews and things have, have sort of limited that. But we've seen a lot more social activity and socializing is a very big factor with the consumption of these goods. And that's where it comes down to. Thank you very much. Everyone stand by. Let's take a break. We'll be right back. We'll talk about the big sector, the financial services, which includes the banks after the break. Nigeria's financial system remained resilient in the second quarter, as evidenced by the latest GDP report. Straight now to Joshua Debussy, banking analyst at Vetiva Capital. Joshua, one of our panelists, do you think this 28.41% growth will be repeated in the third quarter? Well, Boasin, I think repetition is not what we're hoping for. We're hoping for, you know, an evolution of sorts. I think when you break down um, the different aspects of the financial system, and you start to look at, you know, what could have likely impacted the figures. You know, you go from your, the fact that a slowdown in economic activity would have reduced um, the level of interest income that the banks would have earned. However, the um, change in um, exchange rates would have also benefited the banks who took positions against a devaluation of the local currency. All of these things would have factored into um, their earnings. And by the time we see the um, financials of the big banks, coming out later on, um, I'm sure this will reflect that. Now, going into the third quarter, we, we don't hope to see another devaluation, although that is still a possibility. However, we do expect to see maybe a bit of an uptick in um, interest income earnings for the banks because of a resumption of economic activities. So it will be a bit of a, a shift and an evolution in the kind of activities that um, the banks would engage in to maintain profitability and to maintain earnings. Now, we also have to remember that our banks are pretty good at um, managing treasury activities, and they have been doing so under some very um, strenuous circumstances for a while now. And I think that this has just made them a little bit more sharp when it comes to looking for opportunities. And obviously, during the, pan the, the breakdown, I mean the lockdown, we saw a lot of banks launch um, different digital solutions in order to sort of create a seamless transition from you know, your in-branch banking to your online banking, your mobile banking, and things like that, which you know, going forward will also improve financial inclusion and should boost banks' um, earnings when everything goes back to normal. But obviously, this has been sort of expedited by the pandemic. But I think going forward, we should see an evolution in the bank's earnings. And we still expect them to continue to perform well, as they have been the you know, best performers for um, the whole year, really. Uh, great. The, the, the insurance sector was, a bit, was under pressure in the second quarter. Um, the chairman of Asuno Assurance, uh, Kerry Booker, what was the uh, latest yes, from the, your sector? Uh, yes, um, uh, I think the insurance sector is, in the financial services industry, the insurance sector is hard hit uh, by the slowdown. And um, I, I think the only thing I would say there is that uh, additional activity that had been expected of the insurance side of the business um, have not materialized, and therefore one would see overall the reduction in income. But there are some few results announced that show that there had been uptick, and the reason being that some of the premiums are paid on an annualized basis or commitments are made for annually and then the payments might be quarter, on a quarterly basis or on a monthly basis. 
Therefore, some of the insurance companies would still come out of this with that. Uh, there might be additional issues tied to some of the disasters because when there is harshness in the economy, certain kinds of um, unexpected incidences uh, crop up and therefore those would also be affected, live side of the business as well as uh, fire and accident insurance and all of that. Accident may not necessarily be there in terms of industrial accident and things like that. But fire certainly had been a proliferation of those. So the insurance industry's uh, overall income might be affected. Claims are going to be higher. Uh, and so as such, the profit, profit of the entire industry would be affected. But there has been decline in the Q2 numbers mm. uh, when one looks at the macro side of the insurance business. Great. Paul Alaje, the central bank and the banks have the moved together to say, look, banks would have to uh, uh, rebook uh, a number of loans because of the pandemic. Do you think the banking sector the, uh, and, and the entire economy, uh, in particular the MSMEs, will go, will go better into the Q3 quarter with what we've seen so far from the central bank and the banking industry in terms of repackaging the loans, giving a bit of a breather and what have you, pushing everybody forward? I think the central bank has played the big brother role for the entire banking sector. And this has a major implication on small businesses. Uh, the fact that they've given that room for a lot of uh, borrowers and those that might have not been able to pay because of obvious reasons, I think to a large extent, uh, the central bank's role is to help the economy to move forward, which of course we now also start counting on banks' record as non-performing loan. Because if that decision were not taken, you would have had the different figure even for banks right now. As non-performing loan, we, all, we have significant impact on, on their books. And if you want to consider what that could have been, as at Q2 2019, there about, uh, banks have been exposed to oil and gas sector, which of course is largely, largely affected with over 6%. And you know that whatever happens to oil and gas, of course, will be evident on the entire economy. Bank have been exposed to approximately 6%. 0.25 trillion naira uh, exposure. And this, not even all the banks in Nigeria, talk about five top banks within, within Nigeria. And that has not fully been paid. And the pandemic, of course, struck uh, around February, March in, uh, this year in Nigeria. So the impact, the, the role central bank has played, and the fact that uh, Monetary Policy Committee has also reviewed uh, MP, NPR from 13.5% to 12.5%, which also means that there is that room for those who want to do business to access facility at relatively, mm. ordinarily speaking, relatively cheaper rate mm. from commercial banks so that small businesses uh, can also <laughs> operate within the sector. Uh, uh, great. Um, Michael, wrap it up for us for one minute. What's your take on the outlook for the September uh, monetary policy uh, committee meeting, uh, which will be very critical? Now that we have the GDP on the table, we have inflation. What do you, how do you think the MPC should decide when they meet next month? I think the first thing to say is that what they should do and what they would do often tend to differ. Uh, I don't expect them to change tact from their approach. They've clarified their priorities. Um, the first is FX, right? That is That has been the key thing for the last four years. The second is they are trying to stimulate demand by forcing through credit. Um, I don't think that the latter is working very effectively. I think it's a blunt tool, um, but I expect the CBN to keep trying to do that. Um, what they would do um, is actually harder to unpack, right? Because um, you then start to bring in, making sure that there's consistency on the fiscal and monetary side. Um, and at the moment, I think um, if the CBN actually um, takes the monetary steps that I I would want, um, there might need to be some alignment on the fiscal front. Um, but I expect them to hold interest rates. Um, I think that there is a possibility of them cutting again. I think that if they do, it will mainly be as a signal because the monetary policy rate itself has very little effect on credit growth and the cost of credit in the market. And that's something that the CBN itself is aware of. Um, 
Perhaps they will toy around with CRR a bit, um, but I think their banks are already on the severe strain, as my <laughs> colleague pointed out. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you so much, all of you, our colleagues tonight here on uh, Arise Exchange. Thank you so much, Michael Famorotti from CS Business, Kari Booker, Chairman of Sunu Assurance, and former uh, Chairman of Nigeria Economic Summit Group. Uh, and of course, we thank you, Paul Alaji of uh, SPM Professionals, and of course, uh, my very good friend, Joshua Debisi, uh, Bank analyst at Vetiva Capital uh, Management. Thank you very much and good night. It's good to have you on the show.